I'm thrilled to be joined by Dr. Frank Wells from Cambridge, uh, who did a phenomenal job yesterday with the beginning lecture. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. So I have the program here, and it's 7.45 yesterday morning right down there. You were talking about the Bishop's Mitre and sort of the early history of mitral valve knowledge. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, it's the, the naming of the valve, of course, is, is interesting. Quite a lot of people know that Vesalius came up with the name, or at least pretty sure that he did. But not many people appreciate why. And of course, the Bishop's Mitre has, is a two-pronged hat, which if you turn it upside down, it looks like the mitral valve leaflets with the cords and the papillary muscle. And uh, his quote, which I gave you yesterday, uh, saying that you can play the fool with the words, and it looks a bit like a Bishop's Mitre is where it came from. Uh, others claim the, 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 you know, the naming of it later on, but actually it probably was Vesalius. Um, but the interesting thing, of course, is that that showed that he actually appreciated that the vowel was more than the leaflets. Right, right. And that is an important starting point for all of us. And in fact, the, the whole point of understanding valve anatomy goes back to the Greek times. And although um, Aristotle was a great uh, physician, he didn't really uh, have much to say other than about the mitral valve, its leaflets being like membranes, but he did mention the cords. Uh, Hippocrates really didn't have anything to say about it at all. And then, of course, Galen talked about the valves a little bit, but he didn't discuss function other than to say the valve had to leak, which is an interesting concept in the mitral valve repair conference. If it didn't leak, the sooty vapors, in other words, the metabolites in the body, couldn't leak back and be breathed out into the air. So um, he, his whole concept of valve function was that it was to and fro valves. Right, right. Uh, and that is important because if you then move forwards to millennia, to Harvey, it was Harvey's observation that these valves were unidirectional in flow, which he'd learned from his teacher Fabricius in Padua, um, that made him think, well, if the heart's beating at 70 beats a minute, and each bit it, beat it pushes out so much blood, there's a heck of a lot of blood going somewhere. So maybe it has to go round and round and round. That was the generation of the idea of the circulation, of course. Um, but again, as you probably heard me say, my passion for Leonardo actually shows that uh, he was onto the, onto the bait earlier, although he never describes the circulation, but a lot of his work's missing. So that was the beginning of the understanding of the physiology of the circulation flow and why valves are there in the first place. It's, it's interesting, and I, I thought it was really neat when you, when you really um, emphasized this, that it's, it is more than the leaflets. I mean, it's the whole apparatus. And, you know, when you start thinking about uh, the valve, valve disease, abnormalities, you really have to think about the effect of that abnormality on the atrium, the ventricle, Absolutely. and everything else. And I think, you know, even many, many cardiologists don't even think that way. They're thinking, you know, is it, is it a leaflet problem or, or that? So, I mean, that, 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 that's really, uh, really interesting. What, let me, so you, you take that knowledge and then you went through, went through sort of the advances in our surgical approach and, and, and all of that. Where do you think, where are we right now in their state of knowledge, of appreciation of the pathophysiology of that and how we approach mitral valve disease? Well, I think really we are at the most sophisticated stage we've ever been, but we keep forgetting what we've learned, exactly as you said. If you sat down with a cardiologist and you actually got him to talk about the mitral valve, he would probably start to talk about the things that we like to think about now as surgeons, this interaction with atrial function and ventricular function. But on a daily basis, they don't use it, they're interested, does it leak, doesn't right, it leak, right, and that's it. Right. So I think we know a lot, but do we use it? And as I was saying again, as surgeons, we tend not to think laterally enough, frequently enough. So. Um, a paradigm for treatment comes along, as with Professor Carpentier, in terms of repairing the valve, which was a standard-setting, goal-setting uh, move. And people will take those uh, procedures and just go on using those and don't think more about it. And what was very interesting to me, liking historical perspective, was going back to people like Dwight Magoon, mm -hmm. who I had a huge respect for, a delightful mm -hmm. man, absolute gentleman, who was of course repairing mitral valves before prostheses were around. And he was doing the triangular resection and imbrication, which the Mayo Clinic still uses, and which suddenly became like a, a, a new light in, in the dawn to many people in the early 2000s when they started to see actually there were other ways of doing it. And then you get the lights of Bob Fraser, a wonderful oh, man, right. who's been doing neocores since 
since the, the 60s, and now we think it's this big new thing. So whereas we're at a very sophisticated level of understanding, and the people who are doing a lot of surgery are familiar with this breadth of techniques, we've got a long way to go in bringing up a lot of the surgeons who do it in the middle of a very large, busy practice and probably are not so familiar with the breadth and the scope of it. And that's, of course, the great thing about this meeting. It brings together all these ideas. There's time to discuss it all right. and to develop it. And it just put it in front of people who don't actually have the opportunity to think about it on a daily basis. So I think we've, we've come a long way, but we've got a long, got way, a long to go. way to go. <laughs> Let me ask you two, two quick questions. Um, what is the state of mitral valve repair in Great Britain? Uh, are there, and, and should there be just certain centers doing high volume versus lots of places doing it? Well, you raise a very interesting question. I think you know that I believe we should have specialist valve centers. And from the point of view of patients, it is a good thing. For the patient, from the point of view of developing the specialty, it is a good thing. In a financial world, it's a very difficult thing yeah, to no, achieve. Very, very One of the things about Great Britain is it's about the size of California, or slightly smaller. So we've got a captive population in many ways. We ought to be able to do it. We have a centralized healthcare provision through the National Health Service. We have centralized data. Uh, and we are actually moving down that line. And it's now a regular occurrence to see hospitals ad advertising for mitral valve specialists, aortic valve specialists, and beginning to pool it, pool the, the work. But as in the US, there's still a significant number of institutions where mitral valve repair is still a relatively low uh, rate procedure, and you go to other uh, centers like perhaps our own where we've 100% repair it. So um, we're getting there. I think in many ways Britain mirrors what's going on with our cousins across the pond. Uh, <laughs> we have done in so many things, uh, and, and there are peaks and troughs in it. But because of its relatively small size, I think we're probably picking up faster than here in terms of general provision of mitral valve repair. Final question. Um, you, you, you're a fabulous educator and certainly educating the, the physician colleagues. Should we be actively educating consumers on what they need to know to be, to be a part of the decision making? Absolutely. I think we should. I really think uh, there is a place for well-informed, well-educated people within a multidisciplinary team. Now, how you set that up is a different matter, but I think you raise a very important point because the one thing the layperson will do, it will ground the meeting. It will Absolutely. actually bring common sense. And whilst many of us get carried away with do a bit of this, do a bit of that, they will say, well, hang on a minute. What's that going to do for me or my mother? And Many of the discussions that we hear in the area of minimal access surgery, in some of the more fanciful procedures that people do, it might just make people stop and say, well, hang on a minute, what can I do to do the best for my patient? And how am I going to be doing and, in 10 years? Yeah, <laughs> and what dare I say in the room in front of the layperson? Because that's really important. Because that's, that's right. ultimately who your uh, patient is. No, I, th I think you're absolutely I'm right. I'm afraid I think so many of the lay public now, the majority, get their information through the internet. And I don't think I'm doing anybody a disservice to say that an awful lot of communication about medical procedures through the media is, dare I say it, a form of marketing. Yeah, you know, big time, and, big time. And, and I think that, that is, that's, that's where the tipping point is. Yeah, I and mean, I'm not talking about infomercials for a hospital or a physician. No. I'm talking about good Absolutely. information. And, and, and maybe that's the role that society should do. But yeah. Listen, you, you, it was fabulous talk. I enjoyed watching it from up Thank here you. and learning from it. Thank you for visiting with Thank us. Thank you Frank. very much. Thank you.